This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Our goal at Everyday Tech is to keep your technology not only working, but working for you. I'm the host, Abram Nanny, and you can join me and my friends Wednesday mornings at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Or search Everyday Tech on your favorite podcasting app or download the MPB Public Media app. And thanks for being with us today. I am Dr. Susan Buttress, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. So you all know that sleep helps with our general health, with our mood, our memory, and even our weight at times. And you might know that dreaming is also very essential to good sleep. If you listened, actually, to the radio show um, Healthy and Fit yesterday, you you might have heard all about sleep, and uh, they delved into some very specifics of sleep. But what I really want to focus on today is the dreaming part of sleep. It's essential to having a good quality of sleep. Now, some of us have troubling dreams and struggle a lot and and sometimes don't even want to go to sleep because of those recurrent, maybe troubling dreams, nightmares, um, and even in younger individuals, sometimes night terrors. Today, I'm delighted to say that we have Dr. Michael Nadorf back with us to talk about our dreams and how we can literally change the quality of our dreams for the better. So thank you so much, Dr. Nadorf, for visiting with us again. Thank you for having me. Well, you know... um, Dr. Nadorf, listeners, some of you may recognize uh, his name and voice. Uh, during drive time, we we had him on with us, and we talked in some generalities about sleep and dreams, but we weren't able to take calls. But today we are, and I'm excited for that because I, I just think it's one of those intriguing topics that... I think all of us have wondered what some of those dreams are all about. And I actually had one last night that that uh, Dr. Nadorf, I may uh, bother you with today because it was it was one of those. Wow. uh, Wow. Dreams. So let me tell everybody about who Dr. Nadorf is and why. We are honored to have him. He's a professor of psychology, and he's a licensed psychologist at Mississippi State University, where he directs the clinical psychology Ph.D. program. But his research focuses on the association between sleep difficulties, particularly nightmares and suicidal behavior. So he's published a ton of stuff, 90 peer-reviewed, over 90 peer-reviewed manuscripts and has had a bucket load of money and external grant funding from national funders. So just delighted again to have you here. Thank you so much. Well, Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, I do want us to maybe do a real quick review um, because I know everybody doesn't get to listen to Southern Remedy every day of the week. Uh, We talk all the time about sleep and, and how important it is. Studies have clearly linked shortened sleep times with heart disease and obesity, reduced memory, reduced thinking skills poor mood, and and like I said earlier, even a shorter life, perhaps. So it does seem, though, that the lack of a certain type of sleep, that dream stage of sleep, may be um, really related to to all those problems because perhaps we're not having a good quality of sleep. Is that right, Dr. Nadorf? 
Absolutely. And, you know, I was just thinking through so many different studies here, and you described that. And um, I'll get into some of them, but what we do know is that sleep is essential. And, you know, as you alluded to, it seems like REM sleep is really an important stage of sleep. It's one where if we don't get enough sleep, the next night our body prioritizes it. So we enter it quicker and we go into, you know, kind of a more dense version of it to ensure that we get it. And so many vital processes happen primarily during REM sleep. Like we know that as far as encoding new memories, that's one of the primary times that happens. It's also one of the primary times that our um, our body's immune system is active. So, you know, part of the reason why it is so important is that's when the body is healing itself and repairing itself. So there's a lot of reasons why the body is emphasizing that stage of sleep. Right. Um, listeners, I'm going to go ahead and give out the the phone number for you to call in because I know you likely have some questions or, or, or maybe some dreams you want to talk about as we're moving through. So I'm going to throw that out now before we go on. You can send an email to family at mpbonline.org to, to just throw out those questions about your, your dream sleep. Or or maybe um, come up with some dreams that, that you're wondering if they mean anything. So feel free. So, um, Michael, one thing that I, I have read, and, and I'm curious is if there are any subsequent studies about that, because there was a... There was a, an old study back in 2006 out of the Sleep Journal that looked at the obstructive sleep apnea and sleep quality and, um, and also the changes that happened with CPAP. And it, it really did seem like once an individual with obstructive sleep apnea um, – had that CPAP with correction, their their dreams maybe changed, and and perhaps their REM sleep improved. Do you do you have any any um, more recent or any comments about that old study? Absolutely, I think it's a fantastic study, and so I think too in understanding apnea, it's important to understand what happens during REM sleep. So during REM sleep, one of the things the body does is it paralyzes itself so that you're not acting out your dreams. And when it does this, you know, it, with paralyzing those muscles, depending on the either factors such as, you know, weight or BMI, or also just the way your throat is formed, you know, just your own biology. Many of us, myself included, I actually have obstructive sleep apnea, will have it where our air, airway will collapse and we're not able to breathe and so what happens is the body creates these little awakenings just to get it so we take that gasp and breathe Mm -hmm. and this can actually happen even several hundred times during an hour so it's it's all these little micro awakenings that happen again and again that are just awful for your sleep and make it so it's very not restful but the nice thing is while wearing a CPAP machine isn't the most glamorous thing and it takes a while to be used to it, over 80% of people who actually use it, you know, consistently actually have full remission from the apnea. Just if you use the machine, the vast majority of people, you know, are able to get full benefit from that. I don't travel without it. Mm. But with that, when you're actually able to stay asleep and you're not waking up, you know, every minute, um, it does drastically change your dreams and enable you to get so much better, more rejuvenative sleep and REM sleep than you are without the machine. So, you know, what I thought was so interesting is that, that the, the severe, obstructive sleep apnea patients recall dreams in in REM 
almost as often as controls or as often as those without it. But their dreams seem to have an increased emotional tone um, and were more more troublesome. Um, and then when they got the sleep apnea um Remediated with the CPAP, they their sleep, their recall of their dreams diminished and went mm-hmm. away. And then what happened when they looked at them like a couple of years later, when everything had just sort of settled down, that that violent or highly anxious dream stuff that they were having prior to their CPAP placement went away. Uh, did you Absolutely. find any of that in in your own experience? I just wonder. Mm-hmm. You did absolutely, and absolutely. And what we see is, you know, what happens around us during sleep often works into our dreams, right? Like if you haven't replaced the battery on that, you know, fire alarm, and it keeps beeping through the night, somehow that beeping works into your dreams mm-hmm. often. And likewise, you know, the physical experiences that we have often do as well. Like if you are hot or you're cold, you know, that often builds into the story as well. So it makes sense that if you're in this state where you're struggling to breathe and you're you're kind of, you know, fighting, you know, to breathe all night, how that can affect the aspect of your dreams and make it so it is more negative. And, you know, one of the things that's kind of an interesting thing is, we only remember typically the dreams that we wake up during. So it's actually not uncommon for people to report when they go on CPAP and they start sleeping in a more consolidated fashion, they actually have less dream recall because they're sleeping through those dreams and not waking up in the middle of them. So you can sometimes see that and also see it where the dreams can be more positive as you described just because you don't have that external factor of fighting to breathe while while you're asleep. Huh. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, this is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Dr. Michael Nadorf, sleep expert, psychologist um, at Mississippi State University. Go State. Go dogs. And so uh, we were talking before the break about – the obstructive sleep apnea and the the quality of sleep and how it changes once you have that corrected. So, Dr. Nadorf, I, I want to ask you just a quick question about that, that as we were talking, you said that we typically don't remember the dreams unless we wake we go through that that waking period at the, at the end of the cycle and this might be a good time for us to talk a little bit about how REM sleep is is at the I guess you would call it the end of the sleep cycle right that's usually about 90 minutes long do you want to talk a little bit about that and how maybe partial awakenings happen absolutely so all of us go through the stages of sleep about once every 90 minutes and we start through non-REM sleep which is the deeper stages of sleep and then towards the end we have REM and then we finish usually with a brief awakening and actually I'll start before I go too far into this just a little bit of nerdiness if you'll permit me uh, <laughs> I just think this is so cool um, so none of us actually remember about the five minutes before we go to sleep because you need to have at least five minutes of consciousness to encode the memory so first and foremost this is my wife has learned over the years don't tell me things in bed because I fall asleep quickly and I'll never remember that we had the conversation. <laughs> if you've ever had that, there's a reason for that. But with that, we all kind of do the same thing, which is we will, you know, during a normal night, we'll go through a 90 minute period. We'll wake up. We, you know, roll over, make sure the house isn't on fire. And then we typically go to sleep. And if you don't stay up in that little intermediate time for at least five minutes, You'll never remember it happening. And it's really funny when people are in this in the sleep center for a sleep study, 
and we show them the video showing them that they do this, even though they have no recollection of it. But one of the things that commonly people will say, and for me, it's when I'm about to travel. Like if I have to wake up early and I know, you know, I need to wake up early with the alarm clock, I'll be anxious about it. And, you know, checking my phone to make sure I have an overslept. And so with that, if you've had a word, you're like, I woke up every single hour. Well, we actually do that every night. It's that you were up more than five minutes every single time you woke up because you were checking your phone or, you know, there's something that kept you up longer. Right. And that's why you remember having that awakening. And and that is just so interesting mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. 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 So um, we do have a caller and and I want us to get to Jenny in Batesville because I think she's got a really interesting dream going on that she wants to talk to you about and then uh we'll get back to to some of the other information Uh uh-oh did we just lose jenny i believe we did as soon as we were starting to talk about it i think Uh, we lost her oh well jenny please call back i know you probably just dropped off and so let me give you the phone number again so you can call back because it sounded like a great one. Yeah, so I think a little bit of her question was about when you have realistic dreams and you wake up thinking, oh, that really happened. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. I guess that's the beginning of our question, and then we can get more specific into it when we, if, if we get our call back. Awesome. Yeah, and that happened. So we all, you know, there's so much individual difference with sleep. But one of them is, you know, for many of us, we're very vivid dreamers. And we know that, for instance, that those who have nightmares are more likely to also be vivid dreamers. Uh, my wife's actually a very vivid dreamer. And so sometimes she'll wake up from a dream and have to ask me, if it, did that actually happen or not? And it can be a bit disconcerting um, trying to figure out if something actually happened or if it was part of the dream. But it's just that people have different, you know, kind of, I guess I'll say strength of REM, um, for lack of a better term. But with it, I'll also mention, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if you have sleep deprivation, the REM is prioritized. and It is kind of a stronger version of REM. So what you will often see is that um, those really vivid dreams happen more often if you've been sleep deprived over the last couple nights. So if someone did have that issue where that was a problem, that may be a way to help relieve some of it. Okay, so more vivid dreams after sleep deprivation, perhaps when you're catching up. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, Jenny is back. I'm not sure if she's, are we ready to take her call? I think we're still working on getting her set up or whoever is calling in set up. Okay. Um, So I guess kind of my question So we often use the phrase like catching up on sleep. Um, Is that something that you genuinely have to do? Like if I only slept four hours last night, I need to sleep 12 hours tonight to really catch up. Or is it just getting one regular night to sleep? Is that really? It's a good question. Yeah, it's not a one to one relationship where if you got four hours of sleep, you need to get 12. Really, what I would recommend is the quicker you can get onto your normal sleep cycle, the better. And the more you can have a sleep cycle where you go to bed at the same time and wake up the same time pretty much every day, regardless of if it's a weekend or a weekday, that makes a huge difference as well. So I just say try to get back to your normal schedule as much as you can. Great. Okay, we have Jenny ready. Hi, Jenny. Thanks for calling. Hey, thank you for taking my call. I... I have some very realistic dreams, maybe once or twice a year, where somebody is in my bedroom, next to my bed, like an older lady, or sometimes it can be an intruder, or I dream that somebody is outside my window, and it's, I wake up, and, and I wake up my husband, and he is scared to death, thinking that he needs to defend the home and figure out what's going on. And I'm wondering if there's any meaning behind this and if there's anything that I can do to not do things. I'm I'm hearing some helpful tips, but um, I just wanted to see if there's any meaning behind these. 
Wow. That sounds like a, could be a terrifying dream. So I'm going to ask another question before I turn it over to Dr. Nadorf. So when, when do you have a visual recollection of what that person looks like, or, or is it just a vague figure? Um, usually I do know uh, what the person looks like. Hmm. Dr. Nadorf, I'd love to hear your comments on this. Uh, I have a follow-up, too, and I'm going to start by telling you it's, it's normal either way with how you answer this, but with those dreams, do you actually see the person when you woke up? No, I don't. And then okay. I'm able to, finally now, I'm able to stop and say, okay, it's a, it's a dream, but usually it is so realistic that I'm, I'm, my heart has is racing and I am so upset. <laughs> so, but now yeah. I just realize that it's a dream going on. So, absolutely. And the reason I asked, even though you didn't say this was yours, but just in case people are wondering, so you can have hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations, which in short is where part of your brain's awake but part's still sleeping. So you can actually have it where you can actually see your dreams every now and again. Uh, once you're awake. And so it, if it happens rarely, it's considered normal. If it happens a lot, it could be a sign of narcolepsy. But that's not your problem. But just in <laughs> case anyone has that. Um, so for yours, where it's a specific dream that happens infrequently, um, is there anything you've picked up on, on things that happen around the time of year that it happens or things that happen right before? You know, any, any connections that you've been able to draw? I cannot think of anything, but I'm sure there's something related to it. But I I can't think of anything. Are you thinking about? I wonder, like, having been more stressed that day or anything like that. Yeah. Right. And this kind of relates to I grind my teeth at night and I Mm. wear a night guard. And I completely destroy the night guard and um, have to get them replaced. So is, do I need to, do I have anxiety? <laughs> do I need to do something for anxiety? So not just based on that, I wouldn't say that. I mean, you, you could, but it, obviously there'd need to be more info. But, you know, I think especially with it being infrequent, um, I would just try to pay attention to if there's something that happened that day that may precede it, because I, I think the idea of anxiety is a good one. But also, you know, when we sleep, when we dream, we know that there are a couple active memory processes happening. One is that that's when our new memories are encoded, but also that's when our old memories are kind of dusted off and dropped back up. And so I'm wondering if there's something that's happening during the day, you know, that is just connected with that recollection or, you know, that dream from the past that's making it happen where maybe there's, you know, an interaction with a certain person that you don't deal with very much, but just some connection out there. Um, But so I wonder a little bit about that. Um, It's a little tricky because it is so infrequent, but there are treatments out there for nightmares that could be helpful, um, and it's just it'll be hard to know for sure um, how helpful it is because we'll have to wait six months to see if it happens. But that you know that could easily be done, and I can give you more information about that. Um, it's an easy treatment to do, but it may be something that can help replace that dream with the dream that you'd want to be having. Yeah, I think I would love for us to to get get to that. And um, do you, can you tell us in, in like a short 60 second uh, right mm-hmm. now, Dr. Nadorf? Absolutely. So going off of what we just said where, you know, new memories are encoded during REM sleep, what we do is we have you write a new dream that you really want to have, and we have you practice that using visual imagery, so really picturing it in your mind for about, you know, 10 minutes, split up over two times of a day, so five minutes twice a day. 
where you're really practicing that new dream that you want to have. And then when you get into that REM sleep, your brain realizes, oh, this must have been important. I need to store it. Uh-huh. And that's how that new content can get into your dream. Oh, I love that. Jenny, maybe you should even try that and see if that can calm. It, it wouldn't, even though it happens very infrequently, um, there, there could be no harm in practicing having a good dream, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you that get... would be a good way to kind of wind down to you and kind of end with yeah. some good thoughts before. Exactly. Before. Exactly. I would give that a whirl and see how, how that goes. Well, Jenny, okay. that is okay. really interesting. Sounds um, sounds like it could be terrifying. And, you know, I, I can imagine the more realistic they are, then that would be very disruptive to your sleep. If you wake all the way up and are terrified, then it takes a while to calm that fight or flight phenomena that that activates our bodies so badly. So, yeah, try that out. You know, I'd like to stay on the phones because our next caller, Lewis, is from Macomb, and he's got some comments about dream logs, which I also have have talked before about, and I'd like to hear Dr. Nadorf's um, thoughts about that. So, Lewis, talk to us about your dream logs. Okay. Lewis, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry. We have a, a bit of a bad connection. We might have to hang up and have you call back just to get a connection better. We were talking a little bit about uh, sleep logs. We had a, a caller who whose connection didn't work well. Lewis, give us a call back if you can. But, you know, Dr. Nadorf, it might be a good time anyway to talk a little bit about dream logs. And do you think those can sometimes be helpful, getting things down on paper to try to figure out what's going on? Or do you ever use that as a technique? I think they are helpful. And, you know, different psychologists view dreams differently. Some ascribe a lot of meaning to them. For me, I ascribe a little less meaning to them. But what I do think that they tell you is a lot of the things that you have going on, whether it be anxieties, worries, you know, sometimes, sometimes things that are affecting you that you don't realize how much they're affecting you. And so when I know that things are getting really busy at work or have a lot of work problems, I find that my dreams, they're never actually about those problems specifically, but I'm always problem solving in my dreams. And so when I notice those, you know, those links, then it kind of gives me a reason to go back and look at you know, what's going on? And is there something I need to change or do I need to just take a step back? So I think it can be really helpful to get a sense of what's going on either positively or perhaps, you know, as far as stress or anxiety. So, yeah, I always feel like um, the other thing that I do, and I've told our listeners about this in the past, I keep a uh, pad and a pen old-fashioned stuff by my bedside and and if there is something on my mind that perhaps I've been worrying about that day or something that you know I'm concerned it may interfere with me having a good night's sleep I write it down on the piece of paper and I tell myself that I'm leaving it there until the next day. And then I'll follow up on that the next day, not during the night. And and honestly, it helps me. Maybe I've trained myself. What do you think? I've always loved that intervention. I There are some people that don't like it. But, you know, I think the reason I love it so much is we know that the worst possible time to think through a lot of really important stuff is right when we're really tired and trying to fall asleep, Mm -hmm. you're just not going to get your best decision at that time. So what I find is doing that exact thing is helpful, especially when you set aside time. And I usually try to set aside time when I know I'm at my best. So for me, I'm a morning person. I'm at my best in the morning. So I'm going to use some of that very valuable time and set it aside so that I can think about those things or figure it out during that because it's amazing how many times something at night feels so stressful or so out of control and then when i look at it with fresh eyes in the morning 
It's like, oh, I totally have this. But you, you need that reset in order to be able to do it. Interesting. Um, I have another question um, about mm-hmm. dream sleep and and the aged. I have read that um, working with dreams can be a real tool for psychotherapy with older individuals. And and there's some data out there that that is said that individuals who are suffering from um, neurodegenerative disease, dementia, mm-hmm. um, particularly, I think, uh, um, in Alzheimer's more, that those individuals tend to have less REM sleep, so mm-hmm. perhaps less dream sleep. So I guess my question to you, I know that you just said earlier that individuals who who um, who stay asleep and don't wake up after their dream, don't remember their dream. Um, how does an individual know if they're moving through and dreaming less that it's not a negative sign rather than a positive sign? Did that make sense? It's a good question. Absolutely. And in general, I think it's a general rule of thumb. If you are moving through and not remembering your dreams, I think that's usually a positive. I view that mostly as a positive because usually the things that kind of wake you up early during that dream or the, you know, the things that keep you awake after is often anxiety or you know, other things. Or, but also for an older adult, it could certainly be pain or things like that. As you mentioned, there are some real notable changes that we see in our sleep as we age. So we have less, um, one of the biggest things is we have less slow wave sleep, that deeper stage of sleep that makes it so it's just easier for things to wake us up during the night. And so with that, you know, you do sometimes see bad dreams and nightmares in those who are older. And there's very little, um, there's very few papers on it. But I'm very proud that one of them that exists is one of mine, Mm -hmm. um, where we looked at older adults and we showed that actually if you have negative dreams, um, that was strongly associated with anxiety. And if you found ways to reduce the anxiety you were experiencing, in that case, there was a paper where we looked at cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety, uh, that the nightmares and the bad dreams actually fit themselves. So, Mm -hmm. you know, Sometimes when you see those dreams, unless they just happen to be positive dreams, I view it more as, you know, maybe there's a little more anxiety or something going on physically that's leading to more arousal. Right. Okay, we have Lewis back from Macomb, um, and hopefully we have a good connection. Lewis, are you there? Yes, uh, I pulled over next to a cell tower. (laughs) <laughs> you're perfect. perfect yeah so talk to us about your dream log comment well many years ago back in the 70s when i used to work in a steel mill and go to uh, college um they had us keep a dream log for one of the classes and uh, i had worked a couple of uh, double shifts and uh, i got it i got in the back seat and took a nap before i went to school mm. And, uh, you know, that, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't part of the dream, but I, I really used to do that. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, after school, I went home and I fell asleep on the couch and I had this dream that when I was sleeping in the back seat of the car, someone jumped into the front and was trying to hotwire my car. I said, oh no, that, that can't happen. And I had this big knife in the back seat and I stabbed him through the seat three or four times. And then I took and tossed him out of the car, and I drove away. I didn't want to get in trouble. Well, I wrote that all down in my dream log, and I was sleeping on the couch in an apartment with a friend where a friend and I had shared. And I had left the dream log open on the table. And when he came in from work, and he looked down at it, they said, what's, he, what's this? And he read what I wrote down, and he woke me up out of a sound sleep. He says, oh, my God, what did you do? <laughs> oh, good. And I said, what are you what are you talking about? He said, you killed somebody. I said, I did? He said, yeah, you wrote it down. You wrote it down right here. I said, oh, no, that was a dream. 
So from then on, uh, I made sure that if I wrote something down that we were, I get in trouble for, I made sure I closed the law before I went back to sleep. <laughs> you thought she wrote a testimonial, Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> He, he thought it was it was my admitting what I had done. You know, I don't know what what he thought, but uh, it was crazy. But uh, numerous numerous times, you know, a, a lot of dreams, you know, normal dreams about traveling somewhere and stuff like that. Um, you know, I've been to a lot of places I've never been to in my dreams, and it's like actually being there. Huh? Do you read a lot about? places um, that you've not been to? Are you a, one of those travel readers, perhaps? Well, well, no. Um, I've lived in uh, three different countries, five different states. I was stationed overseas. I lived in uh, Germany. Um, and I, I traveled a lot. But there are some places that I'd like to go that I haven't been to. And I guess in my dreams, uh, I, it took me there. Which brings up something, Dr. Nadorf, question. Mm -hmm. So yeah. are you, if you go to sleep thinking about, oh, I'd love to go to Belize, I wonder what that's like, are you more likely to dream about that? Can you, can you set your dreams? Absolutely. You can absolutely affect your dreams. And, and that's the thing with that nightmare treatment I described. You don't have to just do that for nightmares. If you just want to change the dreams you have, and like, you know, I'll, here's an example, and I, I'm not going to get much sympathy from the audience for this. I'm actually about to go on a trip to Hawaii. Uh -huh. So, you know, I'm very much looking forward to this. But with it, maybe I want to have some dreams about Hawaii. So with it, I could actually practice with a visualization, you know, thinking of what the beach is going to look like, thinking of what the experience will look like. And in doing so, greatly enhance the odds that I'm going to have dreams about Hawaii. So you can do this even if dreams aren't a you know a problem for you. If it's just an experience you want to have. Well, that sounds fun, Lewis. Um, sounds like maybe that's what you're doing, and maybe you need to to preset your dreams more about your travels that you want to do rather than somebody attacking you <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> okay well thanks so much for calling and i'm glad you pulled over to talk to us about that and thank you for taking my call absolutely Thanks for staying with us today on Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, and we're here with Dr. Michael Nadorf. And, Dr. Nadorf, it's been fun having you. We're not done yet. I want you to maybe in the next few minutes talk to us a little bit about some of the interesting um, research that you've done. I know you've written a lot. You have some great children's videos and books on on um, nightmares and night terrors and, and dealing with them. We, we really haven't touched too much on night terrors. Can you talk to us a little yeah. bit about that? Absolutely, because people mix up nightmares and night terrors, and it's so easy to do. So the main difference is they come from different stages of sleep. So a nightmare is going to be a startled awakening where you have, you know, you wake up startled from your dream. You have a clear recollection of a dream. It's more likely to happen in the early morning hours and not early in the sleep period. Um, whereas a night terror, it looks very similar. So it's going to be that startled awakening. You're going to wake up, but one difference is you're coming from a much deeper stage of sleep. So with it, you're going to be much more disoriented and you may not know what's going on around you. Whereas coming out of a nightmare, you're going to be more oriented. You're going to know more what's going on. Um, and there's also not going to be a recollection of a, a vivid dream. If anything, if you remember any dream with a night terror, it's going to be more so just you know, vague thoughts. It's almost going to be more thought-like than dream-like. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that's just good to know with nightmares is they are treatable. And, you know, one of the things you can do is for some people, actually a good number of people, uh, the nightmares happen roughly at about the same time every night. So the first step would be just, you know, write down what time they happen and see if there's a pattern. 
And if there is, what you can do is something called scheduled awakening. So you just set an alarm clock for about 30 minutes before that magic time. When the alarm clock goes off, you can just turn it off, go right back to sleep. There's nothing else you need to do. But what happens is it makes it so when you hit that magic time, you're not in the right stage of sleep to have the nightmare. So that's how you can actually stop having them. And usually if you do that for a couple of weeks and it's working for you, you can start, you know, weaning off of using the alarm clock and eventually stop using it. Ah, good, good tip there. You know what? Our our final caller for the day is Gabrielle on the road from Fayette who has wants to share something about night terrors. Hi, Gabrielle. Hi. How you doing? Good. Tell us now you are you having night terrors yourself or is this from a child's night terrors? Well no this was this was uh something I suffered from most of my life. Mm. Uh, Mm. And um, I've just now, I've just now actually, um, from what I can feel, have overcome it. Yeah. So talk to us about that. What were they? How did they occur? Well, um, when we moved here to Mississippi, uh, we stayed in a, it was an old uh, uh, slave shack-like house. Mm-hmm. And I used to have bad dreams uh, in that house. And I had them for a long time. As uh, I would just dream about different things. Sometimes uh, dogs chasing me, or uh, 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 I thought I saw things moving around in the darkness. Mm-hmm. And and I just, as from the time I lived in that house, I, as I got older, uh, they didn't get any better. They just got worse. And uh, I had to learn how to deal with them. And I learned to, this might sound a little strange, but I learned to kind of wake myself up in my sleep. And uh, sometimes I, I, when I, when I, if I did it wrong, I'd wind up waking up with uh, what they call sleep paralysis. Ah. Uh. You know, Gabrielle, we have um, just a, another minute or so, and and I think Dr. Nadorf. It sounds like Gabrielle was sort of self-treating, doesn't it? Absolutely. And and the sleep paralysis. I'll just say briefly. Yeah. You know, that is something that we see. Um, it's usually with the transition from REM sleep into wake, where the body hasn't paral- unparalyzed itself. So if you have that where just every now and again you find you wake up and you can't move, if it's rare, that's considered normal and just breathe through it. Just know in a couple of minutes you'll be able to move. But if you have that a lot, it can actually be related to narcolepsy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is another whole topic that I would love to cover, but unfortunately we don't have time. I want to thank you, Dr. Nador, so much. Maybe an, another whole show, narcolepsy and cataplexy. Very interesting Absolutely. topic. Let's, let's make him a regular. Let's have Dr. Nador on all the time. I love this show. <laughs> Gabrielle, thanks for calling. We appreciate it. And I just want to thank you again, Dr. Nador, for all that you've done, your research, your writings, and your continued service to people, not just in Mississippi, but all over the country. We appreciate you so very much. Um, So, listeners, if you'd like to hear this interesting show again or any past episodes... Remember that you can listen to the podcast on your favorite app by searching Southern Remedy, Relatively Speaking. This show is a production of MPB Think Radio and engineered by my producer, Abram Nanny. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, and I hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 11 for Relatively Speaking right here on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.